All right, good evening, everyone. We would like to welcome everyone to the Theochromocytoma and Paraginglioma Awareness Week webinar. This is hosted by the American Association of Endocrine Surgeons, or AES, and in partnership with the Theopara Alliance. I am Dr. Masha Livitz. I'm an endocrine surgeon at UCLA, and I'm one of tonight's moderators. Hi, and my name is Dr. Sarah Oltman. I'm also an endocrine surgeon at UT Southwestern in Dallas, Texas, and I'll be our other moderator for tonight. We have an assembled an expert panel to discuss and answer some of your common questions about adrenal disorders. Tonight's webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the AES Facebook page and the YouTube channel. We'd very much like to thank the Theopara Alliance for providing us with frequently asked questions from your membership. If time permits, we'll also be taking some live questions from the audience this evening, and you can enter your questions in the Zoom Q&A section. Um, please be aware that we will not be answering any personal medical questions or providing specific medical advice. All, um, all commentary will be more generic. Um, for those types of questions being more specific, please seek advice from your doctor or medical team. I'll briefly introduce our expert panel, and we're very, very um, grateful and thankful to have their expertise today, so thank you for joining us. We have Dr. Amir Hamrahian, an endocrinologist and medical director of the Adrenal Center at Johns Hopkins. We have Dr. Catherine McManus, an endocrine surgeon and surgical director of the thyroid biopsy program at Columbia. Um, Dr. James Netterville is an ENT surgeon at Vanderbilt, who will hopefully be joining us. Um, and we also have Dr. Neris uh, Nillable, who is a surgical on oncologist and scientist at the NIH um, and is also an expert in carotid, bo carotid body tumors, so he can help answer our questions about the head and neck perigliomas. Uh, thank you very much for all of our panelists for joining us this evening. Dr. Nullable, um, we'd like to start with the news that Azedra has discontinued their production. Um, can you explain for us how Azedra worked, which patients may have benefited from that treatment, and what other treatment options there are for patients with malignant or metastatic VO and paraganglioma. Good evening. Thank you for your question. So Azedra is a drug that works in a similar concept with what we call a Trojan horse. In this case, the horse is a substrate uh, that this drug uses for the tumor cells to take up and import the substrate inside the tumor. And then we attach that Trojan horse with radioisotope. In this case, enough dose to kill the tumor cells with radiation. So thus the tumor cell specifically uptakes this drug and the radiation kills the tumor cell. It is specific for the tissue or tumor cells or cells that uh, uptake uh, norepinephrine, which is what substrate is mimicking. The indication that FDA has approved is for patients with advanced or metastatic inoperable uh, pheochromocytoma or paragangliomas. Um, so, so that's the indication it's been approved for. Now, other treatment options for patients with metastatic or inoperable pheo, pheo and paragangliomas also includes uh, systemic treatments such as a combination chemotherapy. One regimen that is commonly used is called CVD, which stands for cyclophosphamide, vincristine, and decatabine. Um, so, so, you know, there are other treatment options, uh, many of which aren't approved by FDA. Um, uh, these include a somnostan analog that can, can be selectively used in some patients. Uh, or uh, some of the folks may use tyrosine kinase inhibitors, which is a small molecule inhibitors uh, selectively and should be done based on clinical trial. Um, so, so that's the summary of, um, of, of the systemic treatments uh, that is available for a patient with advanced pheochromocytoma for ganglion. Thank you very much. Uh, our next question is for Dr. Tom Ryan. Um, what labs do you use to diagnose pheochromocytoma and what labs or other surveillance do you recommend after adrenalectomy to ensure there's no recurrence? I think you're muted. <laughs> 
sorry for that. Good evening and thanks for the invitation. Um, before I mention about the, what labs are used most, uh, I, I just want to mention that nowadays the, the most common way of diagnosing fuse and paragangliomas are through the incident halomas. means the patient goes for uh, some reasons uh, to emergency room, uh, urgent cares, and get the imaging study, and they get diagnosed. About 60% of, of the patient diagnosed by that way. But whenever we see a mass uh, or patient have symptoms uh, suggestive of pheochromocytoma, we use plasma and urinary metanephrines as our uh, main tools to diagnose the condition. Uh, there had been some confusion about the plasma versus urine, which one is better, uh, and that may be related to the reference range that has been used, uh, normal tensive patient versus hypertensive patients. Uh, but in general, my favorite is the plasma metanephrine, and uh, that is uh, easy to do for, for most patients. Uh, uh, and uh, that, that is the main tool that we use for the for the treatment. Uh, regarding the after surgery, we um, continue with the same uh, measurement of the plasma or urinary metanephrines. I tend to get at least one time imaging uh, uh, after a couple of months once the inflammation has gone down to have a baseline kind of an image to for the comparison in the future but of course based on the patient genetic testing and uh, the the probability of having uh, future lesion or met metastatic lesions i may do imaging in intervals but uh, but that is the minimum that i do for my patients Um, and Dr. McManus, there was a question um, that a patient had sent in about a biopsy. And, uh, you know, usually we kind of say we, we would never biopsy a pheochromocytoma. Um, can you tell us why that is? And are there any circumstances where something might be biopsied um, for to see if it's a pheochromocytoma? So that's an excellent question. And uh... I don't remember when was the last time that we sent a patient for uh, having a biopsy done uh, for a pheochromosomal paraganglioma. We have received patients who have done a biopsy at outside hospital, uh, sometimes without knowing that the patient had these conditions uh, and they came to us. In general, whenever we suspect these lesions, we, we go after them and take them out, of course, when they're isolated or there are not that many uh, patients, uh, I mean, that many lesions. So there are some rare situations that the biopsy can be used and that should be done after adequate uh, alpha block blockade of a patient uh, to provide a tissue diagnosis when, when there is a need, for example, chemotherapy or, or additional treatments. But in generally, uh, it is not a very uh, commonly done procedure. Yeah, and, and I agree every once in a while we have somebody who had a biopsy done, you know, kind of somewhere else and that we're all um, uh, thankful that nothing happened during that biopsy because what we all worry about, of course, is in an unblocked patient uh, having a hypertensive crisis um, when a, a pheo has been stimulated uh, with a biopsy needle. Um, okay, let's let's move on to Dr. McManus. And can you kind of just go back and generally tell us what is what is a pheochromocytoma in the adrenal gland? And can you explain why does the entire adrenal gland usually need to be removed? Why can't just the pheo be removed? Yeah, thank you. And um, thanks for having me. So um, pheochromocytoma, as you said, is a tumor that arises from the inner layer of the adrenal gland called the medulla. And that's where the, um, the cells live that produce catecholamines, so epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine. And the definitive treatment for pheochromocytoma is surgical resection. And one of the main goals is to remove the entire tumor. And because the tumor is within the gland, it's very hard technically to separate it from that outer layer, the outer cortex. And because of that difficulty, um, we recommend removing the entire gland itself under most circumstances to include the tumor. Um, and the reason that besides just the technical difficulty, um, we prefer to take out the entire tumor is because when we try to separate the tumor from that outer layer, you risk leaving some of the cells of the tumor behind, and that can put you at a higher risk for recurrence. 
And also if there is any rupture of the tumor uh, during the operation, then the cells can escape and that can also lead to increased chance of recurrence. That said, that is the case most of the time. There are situations, of course, in which we do consider removing just the tumor and that known as a cortical sparing adrenalectomy where you leave behind the outer layer, the outer cortex. Uh, in those situations are most commonly among patients who have hereditary syndromes and they tend to have uh, pheochromocytomas on both sides and both adrenal glands. So in order to save some adrenal tissue and prevent permanent hypocortisolism, um, there is an effort or a consideration to do a cortical sparing adrenalectomy, or if somebody has already had an adrenalectomy on the other side and only has one remaining adrenal gland, uh, if it's a small tumor, you may consider also uh, cortical sparing in that in that sense. Dr. Nullable, um, we have a couple of questions here about the hereditary syndromes that can be associated with both pheo and paraganglioma. Um, how does a specific condition like von Hippel-Lindau, multiple endocrine neoplasia, or the various different SDH mutations change patient management? And a follow-up on that is what are the relative risks of recurrence or um, subsequent disease happening later on after initial treatment? Thank you for that question. It is a very important question that I would like to highlight tonight. And this is because pheochromocytoma and paragangliomas are two diseases that carry the highest rate of germline mutations known to any man's, mankind tumor. Because up to 27 or to 40% of the patients can carry uh, germline mutations, that, which means they can inherit from their parents and certainly can pass along to their offsprings. Because of that, multiple guidelines from several professional societies recommends that all patients who are diagnosed with pheochromocytoma and paragangliomas should be seen by a genetic counselor for a germline testing. And now there is a panel that, that's commercially available that tests up to 15 genes associated with these syndromes. The importance of <clears throat> diagnosis correct diagnosis by the syndrome is such that um, many patients would have more than one tumors. In other words, not just pheochromocytoma or paragangliomas, paragangliomas there are diagnosed in these patients. They can have, very, have various other tumors. For example, if it's a von Hippel-Lindau or VHL, they could have brain and spine tumors or the eye tumors. They could have renal cell cancers and certainly pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors in addition to pheochromocytoma. Similarly, if, you, if someone carries MEN2 genes, they certainly can develop a, a type of thyroid cancer called medullary thyroid cancer, and that could be deadly. Uh, for SDH mutation, uh, this mutation can give rise to various numbers of uh, pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas in different parts of the body but also can give rise to a certain uh, tumors in the intestine and stomach called GIST, uh, stands for gastrointestinal stromal tumors, and other renal tumors as well. So it is important that we have a correct diagnosis based on the pathology of the germline mutations for patients themselves and also for their family members. And, and, and that's, that's the indication to test the patients because of the high rates of these mutations. In addition, uh, these mutations will guide the management because we would know what is propensity of the tumors being metastatic. For example, those with ACHB mutations would have higher risk of metastatic tumors. Therefore, the treatment may be a little bit more aggressive. We would intervene surgically earlier. Similarly, Patients with max mutation would carry higher risk of metastasis. In such cases, we wouldn't recommend partial adrenalectomy. Uh, in contrast, patients with von Hippel-Lindau or MEN2 syndrome 
these patients have multifocal disease and recurrent tumors in the adrenal glands over and over again. Therefore, we recommend cortical sparing adrenalectomy because the frequency of recurrence and the low risk of metastases. So the mutations do dictate what surgical options and what disease monitoring and surveillance process is going to be. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. McManus, there's a question in, in the Q&A about, can you tell how long the theochromocytoma has been growing for? Is there something about like maybe the size of it that could tip you off of how long it's been there for? Um, so that usually if they're um, larger tumors, they're, the likelihood of them being there for a longer period of time is, is higher. Um, but um, as Dr. Hamaranian said, the uh, a lot of these are diagnosed with as incidental tumors, so um, or a, a significant number that we see that are referred um, who are asymptomatic are diagnosed sort of incidentally, and though for that that reason, a lot of times they are just um, there for a longer period of time, and patients don't even really know about them, so. Um, I would say larger tumor has probably been there for uh, a longer period of time. Yeah, and it's interesting. There have been some natural history studies that, you know, kind of look at the growth of pheochromocytomas, and they do seem like they grow by a few millimeters every year, even assuming that they're benign. You know, there are some other adrenal tumors, like maybe the ones that produce aldosterone that just get to be a certain size, one or two centimeters, they'll never get any larger. Uh, but the pheos do tend to slowly grow. Um, so if you're somebody who's had maybe scans in the past, um, that would might be the only way to kind of look back and see, was there an adrenal nodule earlier? Um, Okay, um, let's um, let's actually go to Dr. Nolobo again, um, if that's okay. And we've gotten several questions about head and neck perigangliomas. Can you talk about what's the standard treatment approach now of observation versus surgery versus radiation? How does the location and vagus nerve involvement, how does that all play into the treatment algorithm? Thank you for your question. Regarding the head and neck paragangliomas, there are multiple treatments available, which usually means it is applicable to certain tumor locations and perhaps certain types and sizes of tumors. In general, if the patient is asymptomatic and the tumors are discovered based on uh, the surveillance scan or incidental scanning, we would recommend that tumor be observed to see if there's progression of the tumor or not. Um, again, those incidental tumors tend to be in smaller sizes. If patient is symptomatic, then we would need to intervene uh, and, and address the tumor problems. So head and neck paragangliomas are separated in the, in the way into two main categories. The one, that arises from carotid body, which is where the carotid blood vessel splits to the face and to the brain. Uh, the cell starts in the middle where it splits. And that's, that is the typical carotid body tumors. Other tumors, what we call other non-carotid body head and neck pargangliomas, generally uh, arise from Parasympathetic, parasympathetic ganglions in the head and neck area. And these can be from the vagus nerve, from, uh, from sympathetic chains and other areas or, um, uh, or glossopharyngeal nerves and all the nerves that come from the brain. The treatments are different in terms of whether patients should receive surgery or not. The reason because is because these tumors have different profiles in terms of complications. If those tumors arise from cranial nerves, when we remove the tumors, we are risking the function of those nerves. If it involves the swallowing mechanisms, patient would be unable, you know, would be having a difficult time swallowing. If the patient has a tumor, that comes from the vagus nerve, 
cutting that tumor out could damage the vagus nerve and therefore patient could lose the voice because the vocal cord on that side would be uh, uh, paralyzed. <clears throat> the rate of nerve injury in non-carotid neck paragangliomas is about uh, 30 to 40 percent, depending on what you read and the experience of the surgeon. So the indication to remove them usually is reserved to progressive growth, symptomatic, or 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 others impending a structural failure. And, and that has to be discussed on the tumor board in case-by-case -case basis because the complications from nerve injury is quite high. Therefore, some of those patients would receive radiation instead of surgery because the risk of nerve damage is considered to be less. So there are roles for both treatments uh, that needs to be discussed on, 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 you know, with the expert in, in case by case basis. For carotid body tumors, however, uh, the surgery usually doesn't involve a permanent nerve injury. And that's because when we remove the tumor from carotid arteries, uh, the nerve that may get retracted and may, therefore may be temporary malfunction is the, the nerve that goes to the tongue. Other than that, the risk of the surgery actually involves the uh, injury of the carotid blood vessel itself, which can give patient a stroke. Uh, that's about one to 2%. So there are risks associated with the surgery. Thus, the observation in some of these small tumors uh, is encouraged to begin with. However, if the patient's have SDHB mutation, which be as a Bravo, they tend to carry higher risk of metastasis. So we tend to intervene them for carotid body tumor at the smallest size. Um, so that's pretty much what it is. And, and each of these approaches have their pros and cons. So we have to discuss that carefully. Our next question is going to go to Dr. Hamrayan. Um, what should a patient do if they have some symptoms of pheochromocytoma, but their laboratory testing or their scans are negative? Um, can there still be a silent pheo that's intermittently active? And what about for patients who've had one removed, but their labs and imaging are normal, but they still are having some lingering symptoms? Oh, we've got you muted again. I'm sorry, just keep forgetting about that. So maybe I should add, answer this in a two sections. So the first part is about um, um, what about if a patient can have intermittent um, production of the catecholamines. Um, so I always tell my patients, if a patient with a few a functional few paraganglioma sitting at the beach watching the ocean or in the ICU, in both situations, the patient have elevated uh, metanephrines. Uh, metanephrines continue to leak from the chromophene granules uh, uh, and, and their levels in the ICU would be higher, but even if they are at the beach and enjoying their time, they'll still have elevated levels. So these tests that we have are very sensitive and um, generally few does not act like that to be silent for a, for a half of the day and suddenly start to, to make hormone for the rest of the day. So that is one thing, but there are some case reports about the uh, silent pheochromocytoma. Mayo Clinic had a series and they had some, I think 11 patients, maybe in that series about the patient with silent. So these tends to be, and, and interestingly, while they are, we call them silent pheo, some of these patients had improvement in their in their symptoms after the surgery. Uh, so, so there are some case reports like that, but in majority of the case, uh, situation, uh, we, 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 we see the elevated levels and there is not a significant challenge in diagnosing this patient. We do resting metanephrines uh, and uh, we bring the patient fasting without uh, having any exercise or coffee in the morning and lay down for half an hour and we measure their plasma metanephrine. And this test in our hands has been very good. And by, by doing that, we have been able to rule out many false positive uh, tests, uh, I mean, results. 
So uh, again, I'll be happy to answer more if, if there is something around this question again. But regarding the second question about when a patient has surgery done and they still to have symptoms, if their levels are normal, and, and again, plasma metanephrine is a very, a very excellent test to do with excellent sensitivity, um, I usually look for other reasons uh, that could have been there. I would have them, of course, uh, other endocrine issues, thyroid issues, a cardiac workup, uh, many of these patients may have some problem with the uh, additional problem with the dysautonomia. So we have a low threshold with having a tilt table study done in some of these patients who continue to have uh, being symptomatic after surgery, surgery despite having normal levels. So they get get a throw evaluation and based on the clinical picture, we may need to do some additional imaging and go from there. So while doing that, in most cases, uh, I would say more than 90, 95%, we should be able to help the patient and, and have their uh, symptoms under control. And can you also talk a little bit about the different hormones, specifically the metanephrines versus the catecholamines and um, dopamine as well? How, how, how do we consider those various different levels when we're trying to make the diagnosis? Sure, uh, that's an excellent question. Uh, and I saw in the chat, there was a question about the dopamine and the level of the dop dopamine. So, so the epinephrine is uh, almost exclusively done in the, in the, in the adrenal gland uh, and, uh, or adrenaline and norepinephrine can be done in the, in the ganglia and, and the adrenal gland. So when a, when a patient has more than twofold um, uh, metonephrine levels, which is a metabolite of the epinephrine or adrenaline, these patients almost always have their lesion in the adrenal gland. So sometimes by just looking at the uh, chemical or, or the biochemical studies, we are able to predict where, the, where, where to, to look for. And uh, But if they have mostly normetonephrine elevation, in that case, they can have a paragangloma or they can have a pheochromocytoma in the adrenal gland. So that can help us. Um, Dopamine producing tumors uh, are a little bit tricky and there is more chance of malignancy in these patients. So we, we want to be more careful about that. There is some dietary restriction that we, want, we wanted to do when you want to measure the dopamine level. There are some medication that can raise the dopamine like a patient with, on, with Parkinson's disease, for example. Some of the medication can raise that. There is now... Uh, trimetoxytyramine uh, uh, that Mayo Clinic runs a 24-hour urine for that, and that can be used that uh, seems to be have a better diagnostic uh, accuracy compared to dopamine. Uh, it, it's, uh, the, the blood level looks to, to be doing better based on the research, but we only have the 24-hour urine. I think they're working on the, on the uh, blood assay too. But that can be, it's a commercially available and their doctor can also send it. But when we have done all of these, and sometimes uh, there is a need to include the imaging also. When when the when the patient continues to have some abnormal results, and we are not scratching our head and, and not able to, after all the adjustment done, doing resting metanephrines, changing the diet, stuff like that, we still see some abnormality. We may go ahead and get some imaging done. Um, and then to assure the patient and make sure everything's okay. And usually by that combination of things, we are almost always able to get to the bottom of this. If a patient has, after all of this, we can't find anything, most likely they don't have pheochromocytoma and we continue to monitor in intervals. I just want to say I was really impressed with your description of how you measure the plasma metanephrines. It's such a like perfect um, kind of ideal conditions of resting, 30 minutes, you know, supine uh, in the laboratory, exactly the way that it's described. Uh, it's, it's very difficult for us to achieve that. And so I will say that I'll often prefer the 24-hour urine metanephrine because I, I feel like we see some more false positives with the plasma because our our conditions are not so ideal. I'm just curious from the other um, panelists, um, what is your experience with the plasma versus the urine metanephrine? Do you have a preference? Uh, we, I usually do um, plasma if, if I'm, if I have a low suspicion um, for, if it's an incidental finding, I'll do that as a screening test since it's a bit easier, but um, but mostly I will use the 24 hour as sort of my confirmatory 24 hour urine. 
Okay. Um, and Dr. McManus, let's, let's stick with you. And um, can you uh, tell us more about the, the surgical details of a removal of pheochromocytoma? And specifically, can you talk about when a laparoscopic surgery is appropriate or when you consider an open adrenalectomy? Um, and then can you talk about going from the front versus the back or retroperitoneoscopic approach? Do you have any thoughts about robotic adrenalectomy? Yeah, absolutely. So the ideal way um, to, if you can, to take out the adrenal would be laparoscopically um, rather than open. The data has shown that it's associated with less pain, um, shorter hospital stay, less morbidity, um, just the smaller incisions and um, patients tend to do uh, a little bit better postoperatively if you are able to remove laparoscopically. Um, however, there are still plenty of times where um, we think that the open approach is more appropriate. So for larger tumors, greater than about six centimeters, um, I'll often consider an open adrenalectomy. Um, also, if there is a concern for um, malignancy or uh, any sort of invasion into surrounding structures. So if it looks like it is um, invading uh, into, there's any sort of surrounding lymphadenopathy or things that um, we wanna make sure that we are able to resect, having that open um, approach allows for us to ensure that we can get everything out. Um, that said, uh, the real, um, I would say, decision is is on the individual surgeon and their experience. So um, many surgeons are uh, very, very facile and more adept at the laparoscopic approach. And so um, we are seeing that um, patients are able to have that approach, the laparoscopic approach done safely. Um, in terms of the front, um, the transabdominal approach, or uh, going from the back, the retroperitoneoscopic approach. The difference there is with the transabdominal, you're of course making incisions in the front of the abdomen to access the adrenals, which sit toward the back of the abdominal cavity. And that is the, the um, very tried and true safe way that um, that many train and it's a more familiar approach anatomically. Um, and sometimes if I have a larger tumor that I may have to convert to open, you may lean towards um, starting with a transabdominal approach. Uh, for patients who have had abdominal surgery in the past and have adhesions, um, scar tissue, that can make it more challenging to go through the front and the transabdominal approach. So the retroperitoneal approach um, offers um, uh, the advantage of avoiding any sort of intra-abdominal scar tissue. Um, and also if you are in a situation where you're planning to do a bilateral adrenalectomy, um, being able to avoid having to reposition during the operation is also a benefit of the retroperitoneal approach. As far as the transabdominal or retroperitoneal, this is very um, surgeon dependent. Um, and in uh, surgeons who perform both of these approaches, I would say then it is dependent on uh, the patient and their history and, um, and body habitus to uh, see which one would be feasible, um, but there's not much of a difference in terms of outcomes or um, complication rates between the front or the back or the laparoscopic approach. And as far as robotics, um, there's definitely a role for um, robotic adrenalectomy, which is just a sort of an adjuvant to the laparoscopic approach. And um, it's just another tool that, um, that we have available, uh, but it's not necessarily a, a superior approach. So um, that is another thing that I think is, is a nice advancement, uh, but again, not, not proven to be better than the laparoscopic approach.
And Dr. Noble, do you, what are your thoughts about, do you have a preferred surgical technique and when do you decide to do an open adrenalectomy as opposed to a laparoscopic? Great question. Um, I do both a retroperitoneal approach and transperitoneal approach. If the patient is a candidate for a minimally invasive surgery, uh, my career you know, my career does focus a lot more on adrenal cortical cancer. And to that extent, uh, tumors from adrenal or paraganglioma, which I operate on one today, a common, if they're big enough or commonly uh, associated or close or intimately involved the major blood vessels, which they always do, because they always sit in the you know abdominal vena cava or aorta, which are very big blood vessels, we generally prefer an open procedure in case we make holes in these blood, big blood vessels and we don't get in trouble. For adrenal uh, pheochromocytoma, if the patient does not have any signs of gross invasion or the concerns to these blood vessels, we can accomplish uh, most of these tumors via laparoscopic or minimally invasive approach, whether you do a robotic or laparoscopic approach. Uh, so, so that's the summary of it. So, if it looks, if it looks dangerous, um, then we should do it open. If it looks like they're multifocal, uh, whether it's multifocal tumors or one tumor with metastases, but we can still remove the tumor to no evidence of disease status, we should do it open. Because if you have different zip code, it's be hard to do laparoscopically. But size alone doesn't tell us whether that should be done laparoscopically or not. And we remove pheochromocytoma that isn't um, uh, showing any sign, did not show any sign of uh, invasion up to 10 centimeter or, or bigger, right? So that's not uh, all or none, but it has to be considered based on the extent and involvement of adjacent organs. Yeah, and I just want to highlight, I mean, we're obviously very fortunate to have experts here on our panel, um, and probably the most important thing from our perspective is just the expertise of the surgeon and how they feel like they can get this, this FIO out safely without causing any excessive bleeding or other surgical complications and without violating the capsule of the pheochromocytoma, as was mentioned earlier. You know, the problem with violating the capsule, even if it's a benign pheochromocytoma, is that it can seed little bits of pheo cells um, that will just kind of grow endlessly and recur. So really all of these techniques going from the front or the back or the robot, it's, um, uh, you know, every case is very individual and it might, there might be a specific thing that's best for a certain patient, but probably the number one thing would just be having an experienced high volume surgeon who can kind of say what in their best judgment is the safest uh, option for a given patient. Right. So I'll just add on to that, that in addition to the surgeon's expertise, um, this is one particular disease process that the team is really critical, that it's just as much important as the, our anesthesia colleagues and their comfort with being able to um, keep the patient safe in the operating room, ensuring um, with the help of our uh, medical endocrinology colleagues that we have patients adequately alpha blocked so that we can get them safely through the operation. Because those um, medical comorbidities definitely can also influence the ability to ability of whether or not laparoscopic is on the table as an option. Um, Dr. Noble and Dr. McManus, can you guys both comment a little bit about your any experience you've had with um, seeding of parathy or pardon me seeding of theos during um, surgery? I think we might have mentioned it just briefly early on. But what is theochromocytosis? I guess I'll, I'll go first. Um, yes, you know, in my mind, yes, you can see the theochromocytomas, but and that just, you know, a lot of times it's just a mistake or poor surgical technique that led into the rupture of the capsule. Um, and that can happen. And I certainly have a fair share of treatments that people refer refer to me with uh, peritoneal metastasis from the pheo or paragangliomas. 
uh, it is a difficult problem to treat because you can cut what you can see and they all come back. But more importantly, you know, these tumors just don't drop into a certain spot and decide it to grow. They generally have propensity to do that, meaning they tend to have uh, certain genetic abnormalities that uh, makes them more aggressive when they drop and they dig down and they grow. Um, but the most important thing is, to, as a surgeon, we shouldn't let that happen and try the best not to drop something and, you know, someone else has to pick up some other time. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think it's a really tough uh, situation to be in. Um, and that's why the the number one or one of the number one um, top principles in surgical resection is to be able to resect the entire tumor and to keep everything intact. And so oftentimes, however, with in the hands of an experienced, um, experienced high volume surgeon, however they feel is they're going to be able to do that in the safest way possible um, to avoid the rupture and seeding. Um, oftentimes that can turn into a difficult uh, problem if there are in the setting of uh, pheochromocytosis that, that it becomes less of a, a treatable surgical disease. Um, okay, we have Dr. Netterville, who I believe has joined us. So we're going to see um, uh, if he's able to answer a question for us, I think uh, was uh, in the operating room. So thank you so much for taking care of your patients and then uh, joining us today. Uh, I'm, I'm very honored to be here. The uh, Between a thyroid and a very large carotid body tumor, the day took longer than I thought. All right, well, the, uh, well, that leads us perfectly uh, to the question that we have for you. We've had a lot, a lot of patients who are interested in head and neck perigangliomas, carotid body tumors. We had uh, Dr. Nillable sort of talk about his point of view about how these patients are treated. Can you tell us from your perspective, um, it, can you kind of go through the options of observation? When should a patient have surgery? What about radiation? Um, the location of the tumor, and how does that impact the treatment you might offer an individual patient? Well, when we're treating the head and neck pair gangliomas, by far the most common is the carotid body, followed by a vagal pair ganglioma, then the sympathetic tumors, and then some of the rarer ones that are down on the lower neck around the thyroid or even the aortic arch. I think we will maybe bypass and not talk about the jugular and the tympanic tumors unless you want to do that. In the carotid body tumors, it's very safe to remove those. In a series of over 200 we've done at Vanderbilt, we have less than 1% incidence of complications. So when you look at a patient with a carotid body tumor, you say, how long is this patient going to live? Uh, when I see a if patients are past the age of 55 or 60, I think very hard about whether to remove their perigangliomas because they're very slow growing tumors. Uh, so <clears throat> in the carotid body, if someone is 30, 40, 50, or an extremely healthy 65 year old, then we explain to the patient that, you know, taking this carotid body perigangliomas out is extremely safe. I've never had a stroke in taking one out yet. We have less than 1% incidence of vocal cord paralysis. And so that's on the first side. When we start talking about second-sided tumors, then we're much more thoughtful about that. Dr. David Robertson at Vanderbilt, on my early patients, helped to describe varo reflex failure when we take out the second side carotid body tumor. I tell my young doctors, you always hang out with smart doctors and they'll write papers and put your name on it. So he got that published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And that's my one shot to ever get in the New England Journal of Medicine was for his description of barrel reflex failure. So we're very thoughtful about taking out the second side, but many people have to do that. When I see people that are very young with carotid body paragangliomas, then they often have a very fast growth rate and those, we have to worry about metastatic disease in those. And in the ones that we see actually a necrotic center <clears throat> in a 15-year-old or 30-year-old, 
then those have a very high rate of local metastasis of which you really don't have to radiate. You just follow those patients. When we step up to the vagal tumors, taking out a vagal paraganglioma would include removing the vagus nerve, the hypoglossal nerve, the glossal pharyngeal nerve, the pharyngeal plexus. The patient will have a vocal cord paralysis, a pharyngeal paralysis, a, hyper, a tongue paralysis. So I wrote a paper over 20 years ago about taking out 50 vagal paragangliomas. And when I lecture on it now, I say, I'd like to put 30 of those back. I was young and naive. So we try our best not to remove vagal paragangliomas, but observe them or treat them or give them radiation therapy. When a patient shows up like the other day and they have a eight centimeter vagal paraganglioma, the tongue is paralyzed, the vocal cord is paralyzed, they have terrible sleep apnea from the tumor pushing over the pharynx, then that's an indication to remove a vagal paraganglioma. The sympathetic tumors can be removed very safely with just a Horner syndrome. And certainly the ones lower in the neck, as long as they're not on the vagus nerve, we remove those. That's a pretty good summary of the, of the head and neck tumors. Great, thank you. Um, this next question's uh, been answered by some of our um, audience. This one's gonna be for Dr. Hamarani. And um, is there any particular medications or anything that we do that can cause um, a pheochromocytoma to develop like excess stress or overstimulation? Um, yeah. you know, I'm not aware of any uh... A stress causing pheochromocytoma or um, paraganglioma. There are conditions that can be confused. Uh, I just should mention maybe before that that you know we know that hypoxia uh, predispose patient with the uh, with to have paragangliomas. People with the heart disease, congenital heart disease, where have been exposed to hypoxia for a long time, they tend to have more uh, chance of having uh, uh, paragangliomas. Uh, re related to Patient with stress, there are a number of things to consider when you evaluate them. There is a situation of, uh, I mean, other diagnoses such as labile hypertension that can be associated with stress, panic disorders. There is a phenomenon described as a pseudophyochromocytoma when the patient can have actually some elevated levels. Um, uh, Sometimes they have a traumatic uh, uh, history of a significant trauma, for example, um, being raped had a very bad uh, relationship in their um, young life. Uh, and these people can have significantly elevated blood pressure levels um, with some abnormal biochem biochemistry, but uh, they have negative uh, imaging studies. And when they're totally woke up, they don't have any evidence of that. So we consider all of these when we evaluate the patients, when they come to us with symptoms suggestive of pheochromocytoma. Um, and 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 do a true workup, but but I'm not aware of that. Just a chronic stress by itself causing causing this. Thank you, um, Doctor Nullable. Um, if we can ask you, what's your surveillance strategy for patients who have an SDH mutation? Um, what screening is recommended? The interval and for how long? Thank you. Um, that is a, an important question because SDH, particularly SDHB, is the most common inherited uh, germline mutation associated with pheochromocytoma and, more importantly, paragangliomas. The recommendations, um, so we have published uh, the guidelines for SDH delta or SDHD uh, last year, and uh, SDHB as a Bravo is being published soon. The bottom line is that uh, based on the literature, uh, the patients with germline test testing positive should be screened at the age of five or six years old. Uh, and the most common form of imaging screening would be MRI from head and neck, chest and abdomen to minimize the radiation exposure. In addition, they all should have metanephrines check whether it's plasma or urine uh, fractionated metanephrines, non-metanephrines, an annual basis. If the screens, because not all the patients with mutations would develop tumors, depending on the mutation, the penetrance, meaning if someone 
carries the mutation, not all of them will have the tumors. And certainly as the age progresses, the chance of developing tumor is more accumulatively, but not all of them do have it. Uh, so take that to in, into the consideration. However, if those who have had tumor diagnosed or removed, they can have another one. And thus the screening would include the metanephrines to detect chest and abdominal paragangliomas. For head and neck paragangliomas, uh, they are typically non-functioning and therefore the only way to diagnose would be imaging. The recommendation is to do MRI plus uh, what we call st some of the stand receptor imaging such as 68 gallium dotatate that is uh, if they are proven available in most major institutions. Um, and the frequency between one to two years depending on the findings and the risk and the size of the tumors. Um, this next question is for Dr. McManus. Um, we have a question in the chat about how do the surgeons work with pathology? Um, some of the patients have mentioned that there's some variability they've seen in the pathology reports about ensuring all of the correct variables are reported on. What What is your practice? Yeah, so we're uh, very fortunate to have... Um, a uh, multidisciplinary uh, tumor board, essentially discussion um, with adrenal cases. And so uh, we often have uh, several pathologists who are uh, very familiar with the, um, all of our adrenal um, pathology specimens and they know uh, we, we've made it um, all very well known and um, clear to report all of the um, important markers. And so we can calculate the various scores and, and make sure that um, we can get all of the information that we need to, if it's any sort of prognostic or um, informative in terms of uh, any sort of additional therapy or um, tumor markers that um, they can provide. And if that, if uh, it's not, so typically we have the um, same uh, few pathologists that are reading our, our pheochromocytoma cases. If we don't see um, any of that information, we uh, always will reach out and, and ask for the different testing that we're looking for just to be um, thorough. And how do you manage if the patient surgery was done outside of your system and they're coming to see you after the fact? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so in that circumstance, what I would try to do is I would try to see if we are able to get the pathology specimens sent over to our institution for um, for analysis. Uh, and um, that can be a, a bit of an onerous process, but I think um, many institutions are familiar with, um, with what that entails. And so I would work with the patient to um, try to get that uh, data over to our our institution for um, a second opinion and and our interpretation. Great, thank you. Um, so we have about five minutes left. What we'd like to do is kind of end with asking each of our speakers to just sort of discuss what do you think are the most important, maybe recent advances that have been in the field or things that might be coming up in the future that you think might improve the care of patients with pheo or paraganglioma? And I'd like to um, start with Dr. Netterville, um, if you could kind of answer that. And right before you do, um, I, I, there's one more question in the Q&A that we just like you to address. The question is about a patient with um, a paraganglioma and, the, and is there a way to remove the tumor without completely removing the vagus nerve? Oof. Um... I suppose, you know, Dr. Netherview probably had done more of these since I don't generally try to attack vehicle paragangliomas. So um, the, the literature says that 
you know, the permanent injury is uh, uh, 30 to 40 percent of this nerve. I suppose that uh, some of the folks had done without injury, but what I've seen, the patient coming in, they commonly have a vagal nerve injury than not because the tumors tend to be integrated to the nerve. It's not like um, neurofibroma, you know, neurofibroma that you can split the, the nerve sheath and scoop out the tumor. It's not quite like that. But my practice mostly in carotid body tumors for that reason. Um, I'll defer that to Dr. Nedaview, who had probably done more vagal paraganglioma, because in my mind, you know, unless the tumor is progressively compressed or growth or compressing, that needs to be removed surgically. I tend to recommend not to have that done surgically. Okay. Yeah, Doctor, uh, thank you for that answer. Dr. Nedaview, what are your thoughts? Well, there's people described the vagal tumor in the past as a juxtavagally tumor or an intravagally tumor. And they basically tried to say some tumors grew alongside of the nerve grew on the surface. Well, I think that, that those few patients where the nerve was on the surface were probably sympathetic tumors and not vagal tumors. Of the many vagal tumors that I have seen over time, uh, there is always injury to the vagus nerve when you have to take them out. And so that's, uh, I completely agree with my colleague here. We try our best not to take out vagal paragangliomas unless the patient has already had all the cranial nerves already paralyzed and they have aggressive growth of the tumor. And we can certainly rehabilitate those, those patients with an implant under their vocal cord and palatal adhesion to block the nasopharyngeal airflow, and we can get them swallowing again just fine. But in my practice of 36 years at Vanderbilt, I've had the privilege of watching these people that do, after those surgeries, they do well in the five-year mark and the 10-year mark. But I've watched people 20 and 25 years, and they're swallowing ages much faster when they've lost all these cranial nerves. So I've seen them suffering 20 years later. So we try our best to leave vagal tumors alone. Okay, so this idea of scooping out the tumor and peeling it away from the vagus nerve is not really realistic. Not at all. Okay. And I see patients going and coming back for second opinion from me, saying this doctor assured me that they could take it off my vagus nerve. And I said, well, I'm not sure that doctor's seen many vagal tumors then. Okay. All right. Thank that you. That's been my experience as well that, you know, if it, it's truly vagal, vagal or, you know, glossopharyngeal type kind of tumors, they all get damaged pretty easily. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, Dr. Hamrahian, any kind of last thoughts about recent advances in the field or things that might be coming up that could be helpful for patients? Well, well I think having availability of Lutatera uh, right now as part of the clinical trials, uh, especially as, as our colleague mentioned, with the Azidra going out of the uh, not being produced uh, maybe to the first quarter of the 2024. Uh, so uh, so that, that is something uh, we hope that be available for our patients. Uh, I, I don't do chemotherapy, uh, but uh, I have heard some good results from tyrosine kinase inhibitors uh, used in, in patient with metastatic disease. Um, usually these are done by our oncology colleagues. Um, so I would say these are probably for me, the, the most important two, two recent things. Okay, thank you. And last comment to Dr. McManus, um, any, from the surgical perspective, uh, any recent advances or things that you think might be coming up for uh, surgical treatment of patients with VO or perigoglioma? Um, so uh, not so specifically um, new surgical advances, but there was um, a study published recently that showed that um, uh, looking at cardiac uh, impact of um, surgery and found that after surgical cure of, um, of perigangliomma pheochromocytoma, that there's actually some reversal of the cardiac dysfunction. Um, and so uh, at up to six months after the surgery. So I think having that um, information is helpful in terms of education and patient education and, and also in emphasizing the role that surgery can have in treating this disease.
Great. Okay. And of course, we're so thankful for organizations like the Field Pair Alliance for allowing us to do this today, um, to connect patients that we know that you're coming from all over the place, um, and to allow us to kind of share our experience with you um, is really, you know, we need organizations like the Field Pair Alliance to connect us. So thank you so much. Um, as we approach the top of the hour, we really want to thank our viewers, supporters, and the Field Pair Alliance for their support, and really a special thanks to our expert panelists for taking time out of their busy uh, schedules to answer your questions about pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma. And as a reminder, this session was recorded and will be available on the AAES Facebook page and the YouTube channel. And you'll can find more helpful information um, at the AES patient education website, which is www.collectedmed.com backslash AAES patient education. And that was put in the chat at the very beginning. So you can find the link there as well. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a good evening. Thank you.